It's been more than a month since we spoke to you from Rijkersfontein North Rand Training Centre about the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the South African horse racing industry. And my father once told me, he says, when it comes to problems and trouble, always try and take the emotion out of it. And it's very, very difficult to take the emotion out of anything to do with horses because they are God's most beautiful creature. Of course, a subjective statement, but that's the way we feel. And we spoke to Adrian Todd, who's the managing director of the South African Equine Horse Protocols Organization, to tell us exactly what the plans were for Rijkersfontein, for Turfontein, and indeed for the Vaal race course, as well as Summerfelt, Ashburton, Fairview, Kimberley in the Northwestern Cape, and then Philippi and Milliton. I hope I haven't forgotten anybody out. But the point is that the South African horse racing industry has come through these two lockdowns with flying colours. And we now sit on the edge of an emotional precipice where the government will let us know today whether or not we can commence racing tomorrow. It's a very, very gut-wrenching time. And for that reason, I'm going to let Adrian Todd and Hazel Kair from the National Horse Racing Authority, her title is Executive Racing Administrator, to tell us exactly how they see the presentation to the government having gone. We're also going to speak to former champion trainer Michael de Kock, who's also on a very powerful board of the Racing Association. We're going to speak to the champion trainer, Sean Terry. We're going to speak to a guy called Michael Azzi, who's dedicated his life. He's been in the game for over 50 years. He's a fourth generation trainer. And we're also going to speak to five-time champion trainer, Jeff Woodruff, to get some perspective as to how things look. Paul Peter also enters the mix from Turfentane. He has the favourite for the Wilkebos Drift South African Oaks. Her name, of course, Summer Pudding. We've got news on her. And then we're going to speak to Dean Alexander, who represents a very powerful stable that's been going for a very long time, Team Alexander Racing. So without any further ado, let's get over to Rijkersfontein and catch up with Adrian Todd. When we first got asked to get involved in this, um, and the RA came on board as being the funders behind putting procedures in place. We, we utilised our team's expertise and that is in epidemiology and risk mitigation measures because generally human medicine treats individuals as an individual and here's a slightly different situation in that we're working on minimising the risk and increasing the probability of disease freedom for a population. Now here at Rankiesfontein, as one example of many, the grooms live on site, this is their home. So the concept of, okay, let's close something, what are you closing? The animals still need taking care of and the grooms still live on site. So the responsible and the logical approach is to do everything possible to minimise the risk for that population of people that live in that environment. It's the same as anybody else living in a neighbourhood, living in a block of flats, living in a large house with their family. You have to look at the population of that environment and do everything you can to mitigate the risk. Now we've brought in access control, temperature scanning, sanitisation, and that's done at a number of points throughout the facilities. You know, the grooms have come on board and every day we're working to improve it. It hasn't been ideal at the very beginning because it was a very new concept. But we've had medics here on a regular basis providing training for the security guards, providing training for the grooms, and we're moving forward. We're now working on a more comprehensive data collection program that we want to roll out in the next week that will be electronic and will be nationwide. And it's that collection of data that is going to be imperative because trust me, we're now going into a stage four lockdown. Who knows, maybe in a couple of weeks we'll be at stage two, etc., etc. But the concept of disease risk mitigation that we have to have in place wherever people come together is going to be with us for quite some time. It's not that the virus is suddenly going to leave our shores. And for us to be able to function in any way and to sustain the industry, the industry has to have a very strong comprehensive risk mitigation plan in place. And that's what the NHA have been working with government on. We've been liaising with the NHA and we all heard it last night from the president that individual industries will have the option and the opportunity to put forward their plan to government. I read it in the paper before. 
that announcement even that each industry is going to have to have its own risk mitigation and workplace safety plan in place. And it's something that we just have to do. It is going to become the new normal. It's exactly the same as controlling disease risk for the, our horses, except now we have to apply those lessons and um, that expertise to people. And as I said at the beginning, these grooms live at these facilities. Whether we're training horses or not, they, or we're not racing now, but they live at these facilities. So protecting racing's participants in their homes is the number one priority of everything we've been putting in place and doing. And I just want to reiterate how none of this would have been possible without the support of the RA. The RA took the bull by the horns here, asked us to do the risk assessment, and then funded what needed to be put in place. And realistically, when you look at the groom scenario, the only thing they've really been short of is those bonuses for winning big races or for winning important races. They've had their salaries, they've had the roof over their head, they've had their regular job, and I think that's been a Herculaneum effort on behalf of the racing industry. Yes, definitely. I think from what I've seen, everybody's tried to work together as much as possible. Um, unfortunately, we have seen some of the naysayers come out, but you're always going to get that in any industry. And um, I think we must just overlook that. We must um, look at a way through this crisis. And that's, that's the only option we have. So to put the lid on it, in a nutshell, would you say that keep it simple stupid is the way in which you've embarked on this process. In other words, impeccable sanitation, temperature reading, making sure that everybody is following a very simple and effective routine. Definitely, Andrew, and you know, there's always room for improvement. We had struggles getting hold of um, temperature scanners. We've had them break. We've had to get more. Hand sanitizer became hard to get your hands on. We found um, reliable suppliers. So each day you're learning more and more. I don't think there was anybody in the world that had a COVID-19 plan a couple of months ago. So it's an evolving thing that you do the best you can and you keep looking to improve, take on experiences that you've had, look at experiences other industries and other countries have had and keep working with our epidemiological team to get ahead of the epidemic. And needless to say, the bigger picture for you is the export of resources from South Africa to the rest of the world. That's presumably all on hold until the globe finds a way to safely introduce people to inspect our facility without any risk. Well, yes, um, you know, we're, we're listed as an essential service by DAF because you, you can't um, stop the control of one disease because of another disease. So the control measures are going ahead. Um, active surveillance is taking place, the passive surveillance is taking place. We're obviously not issuing movement permits at the moment. It's been an opportunity for us to do a lot more internal auditing, albeit remotely, but everything's on a server anyway. So it's been an opportunity for us to do a lot more internal auditing of the systems. The EU audit was supposed to start on the 20th of April. It's obviously been postponed. It hasn't been cancelled. The EU have assured us that as soon as it becomes safe to travel to South Africa and South Africa opens its international borders, then we will be having an audit conducted. And I think after this COVID-19 crisis, as we all work to rebuild racing's economy, the ability to export and trade internationally is going to be even more vital and important to the sustainability of our breeding industry than it was before. So it's something we have to keep going, have to keep pushing across the line. And the funding's been coming in, the RA, a number of um, individual breeders have come on board in a good way to get the funding finalised. But we need to just get that finalised and get that across because otherwise all the work we've done for the last many years has been wasted. Well, basically we've put an argument that without racing, the whole industry collapses. Not to be alarmists, but one of our concerns is from the breeding side 
to the training side, to the actual operations of staging our races. If there is no races, everything else comes to a shutdown. So it was very, very important to us to stress the government to say, is this just not for the benefit of people coming to bet? Um, let's park that aside. Um, what our focus is to at least provide an opportunity for trainers to make money, an opportunity for jockeys to make money, for grooms to get back into the economy and make money. Um, so with that, hopefully, that will have an overflowing flow at trainers as well as to breeders. Well, that old expression, the chain is as strong as its weakest link, is certainly the, the case over here because we all know that the owner has borne the brunt of the financial disaster more than anybody else because they earn stakes which come from betting, but at the end of the day, if there's no racing, they're not earning anything. And it seems like the only way to, to reignite the whole thing is to get racing up and running again is a very real possibility. Um, that's correct, Andrew. Um, we're very quite fortunate that the sport of horse racing, we are able to put in measures with regards to social distancing. Our aim to government is to at least give us an opportunity to at least race, to make owners be able to at least earn some form of income um, while the races are being staged. Our next priority is going to go to the grooms as well as to the trainers as well as to their jockeys so that they also start earning income. As we know, the trainers have started already, their business has shrunk by about 20%. Jockeys are literally not earning anything right now. So this COVID-19 has had such a ripple effect across the whole industry. And it's really important to safeguard and also to maintain the trident owners that we have so that we they keep on, they're having their passion for racing. So we're hoping that government will definitely um, give us a go ahead to start racing soon. The supposition that transformation has not been as rapid as it could have been in the sport of thoroughbred horse racing gets kind of turned on its head when I encounter somebody like you with a background that you've got and a passion for a sport that really is very difficult for a lot of people to actually understand. Well, transformation as horse racing is slightly a little bit difficult because it is a specialised and close niche. Um, however, there are a lot of opportunities that have been provided. For example, myself, I started off a gold circle and we went through the Summerhill School of Excellence. I was given the opportunity to go to Hong Kong. So I'd like to believe that the industry in its whole has actually created opportunities for people to transform. So it's not just about opportunities being created, but it's also about the individuals themselves being able to grab hold of those opportunities and make something out of them. There are a lot of initiatives that have been done to assist in terms of transformation. Yes, we are still wanting. However, I'd like to believe that there has been a positive steps happening across from the breeding to the training centres to um, the NHA as a regulator as well as to the racing operators and the RA. Okay, with every interview there comes one curve ball and that is quite simply, we know about the involvement of great gentlemen like Richard Maponya who recently passed away and Bridget Radebe. But the reality is that unfortunately we haven't seen as many black diamonds or entrepreneurs come into the sport of thoroughbred horse racing as we would like to have seen. Well, into the sports of um, thoroughbred is slightly a little bit different when trying to attract the black diamonds. A lot of them just believe that it is about the show in terms of the in terms of the Vodacom Durban July, the Summer Cup. It's about the dressing. I think there has to be a much more considered effort to bring people in in terms of getting them closer to the horse so that they can get to understand the passion, that they can get close um, up close and personal to the actual horse so they can fall in love with it. I do have to say we do some work with traditional horse racing. There are a lot of black diamonds that are getting involved in traditional horse racing because they do understand that this is where they've come from, from the horse. So it's now a matter of horse racing now, trying to find measures in place of bringing those people from traditional horse racing into the thoroughbred um, um, stream. And hopefully you'll find a lot more transformation from the ownership base on that side. And you'll also know that in terms of racing, it's all about passion. Passion, 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 and put in, people put in their money, not necessarily because they're trying to make money, because you know you don't make money in racing, but they do it for the love of it. And it is, we need to then maybe try and change our script and say, let people fall in love with horse racing. I know for me, I wasn't so much in loving horses until I spent some time at Summerhill at the farms. And from then on, I was just hooked to the horse. So it's actually giving an opportunity um, for people of color to become close and personal to the horse. I think we might be able to change the script there. With regard to Mrs. Rupert, um, we know that she definitely doesn't own racehorses to make money. Their breeding program is so discerning that one would hope that ultimately they would make money. But it is about passion for her and it is through her kindness 
and generosity that this program is going out on air. So we'd just like to say a huge thank you to her. What, what's your view from the National Horse Racing Authority perspective with regard to breeders funding operations like this? No, we're very grateful. I think it is a great opportunity because the industry will not exist at all without breeders. They're the fundamental key to our existence. And we're so grateful for their input and being able to make this program come to life. Um, therefore, their funding in terms of different various initiatives that happen into the industry. So we're just quite grateful because they are key. They are fundamental. They're the start of it and they're the end of it. So without them, there is no industry. So we are very grateful to them. Obviously, the animal welfare is, is our main uh, objective at the moment just to keep things going and keep the horses healthy and sound and and our staff as well you know that's a, a big factor um, but you know look the racing industry we're resilient we tough we, we fight hard um, in saying that you know about these viruses and this virus it's this pandemic um, racing is no stranger to viruses we've had to we've had the equine flu virus uh, to contend with over the years and our guys are really get up, uh, obviously, when we get flu viruses in the yard and stuff like that. So they, we're vigilant. We, we, we don't like to carry viruses from one horse to another. So they're trained in that respect. And uh, I think the important thing is how we've handled this. I think the racing industry as a whole, keeping horses going, working every day. For us not to be racing for me is crazy. I think we should be racing. I think uh, it's detrimental to, to the welfare of uh, the horses to start with. Our owners need stakes, um, a lot of them, their businesses aren't functioning. They need to generate money to keep this industry going. We're going to have devastating effect if it's not. Thousands of families depend on it, stud farms. So, yeah, I, I really think we should get things going and, and, it's, and it needs to be happen urgently because we know the consequences if we don't. I think everybody's responsible, everything. They want the right things to happen for the right reasons. So, yes, I mean... Uh, we showed before the lockdown, during the shutdown, we raced uh, the ghost meetings, which were successful. There's no outbreaks from racing there. We've been carrying on at all the race, uh, the training centres. Uh, there's been no outbreaks. So, yeah, we are vigilant. We're controlling things. Everybody's responsible. We've got nurses that come in and check our guys. There's a lot that is happening behind the scenes, uh, and, it, and it's all done for the right reasons. So, yeah, definitely, I don't see any reason why. I mean, we're training these horses here every morning. They're going out on training tracks. I don't see any reason why we can't be racing in the afternoons. The racing centres itself, we house enough horses here at Turfentine to have standalone meetings. Yeah, and so does Reinke's and so does the Vol. So you don't have to travel. Um, we could have our meetings here once a week. Reinke's the same and, and Vol the same to kick things off. And I think that would just start the process and with minimum risk. Obviously, I mean, like I say, the horses are here out every morning training. So... Whether you're training yeah, in the morning or racing in the afternoon, it's the same thing. The grooms have really bought into the, the whole uh, protocol, if you like to call it that, very well. Strict sanitation, hygiene, and uh, I've been immensely impressed. And uh, things have gone on pretty much as usual, and I think we're probably very fortunate with the work that we do um, gets us out and you know we're outside a lot. So, yeah, it's actually been probably a lot kinder lockdown to us as a stable than, than to most other industries, I would think. Obviously, uh, everything costs the same whether you're racing or not. Um, you've got to pay the feed merchants and the bedding merchants and everybody else and the Fair wages, the everybody. And, you know, horses, um, you know, do, do need veterinary attention. So it, everything's gone ahead pretty much as, as normal. And... Uh, Fortunately, uh, you know, the funds have kept coming in and nice to have a, a, a good bunch of horse-loving owners. They, they realise the necessity and uh, the horses have been very well looked after. How long can you sustain that? If, indeed, we know the government has lowered the level of lockdown by one phase. Possibly the, a lot of the businesses, are the, the, the money's drying up, so... Um, horses are a luxury item and that would be uh, one of the first things to go you know people will will tend to lose faith and and uh, hopefully we don't get to that position I don't think we will um, if we get the go-ahead to race on the weekend well that'll be fantastic um, 
and you can at least even for reduced stakes it'll be something coming back in but uh, bottom line I, I think I think we could we could probably hold out for another month but you certainly wouldn't want that look the grooms are in a, a good position in that even though they don't have the, the, the relative freedom of movement I think they're accepting of the fact that it's more important to have a job and you would think that a lot of these guys are actually horse lovers and they don't just treat it as a job, but as a holistic endeavor to put bread on the table. Yeah, I love 100%. Um, I've got guys here that have been with me for over 20 years and they're horse lovers first and foremost. Um, so, so, like I say, the work's gone on as normal. Um, what has impressed me the most, I think, is the adherence to, to the guidelines and to the rules. We've made rules here. You, you don't just come and go uh, as you please. Taxis have been laid on on a Wednesday and a Saturday for shopping, um, where one guy might be shopping for 10 others. So, it, and, and we're lucky we've got a shopping center close to us. It's only a, a two or three kilometers away. Um, so everybody's bought into the whole thing. Um, the, I'm just amazed that, well, hopefully, we, we think anyway, uh, we've kept the virus out of Rheinkisfontein, and if that's so, to have 400 healthy people, that's, uh, I think, bears testament to the, um, the, the efforts that Pumalela have put in, which they have done, they've been very, very good, and the security. Um, everything's gone very, very well, and, and of course it's been only open to absolutely essential services, vets, farriers and feed merchants, and that's it. Okay, now the reality is that the government have to make a decision based on our proposal, which is an extremely sound one. It's got nothing to do with the sport of horse racing. This is about life and death for families that are dependent on the sport of horse racing, the horses can carry on like this. We can carry on like this for a limited period of time until the resources run out. But it's mainly about the people that are employed about the game. Would you concur with those sentiments? Oh, most definitely, yes, Andrew. You know, um, loads of people are dependent upon the game. Let's just start with my staff, the grooms. To start with them, first of all. These guys are professionals at what they do. These guys are trained. They're skilled at working with these horses. You cannot just take a normal guy standing on the side of the road and come in here and throw him into the box and say to him, yeah, groom a horse, ride this horse to the track. He wouldn't know what, where to start. These guys are skilled laborers. They know exactly what they're doing with horses. Some of these horses know their, 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 their lad. They, they respond to him. And uh, it's, a, it's a skilled job. Their family depend upon them. So with, without this job, they lost without an income. So, and it's got to the point that where certain clients are actually coming to the point where they're saying, listen, I'll pay you up to the end of this month, and as of the end of this month, this horse is yours. Now, I'm faced with a dilemma because I feed 12, 13 horses of my own. I cannot have people phoning me and saying to me, they're only paying me up to the end of this month and I must take over their horse. Because I cannot continually be left with more and more horses of clients and have to feed them because I can only feed so many horses and I can only feed so many horses for so long. It's going to get to a point where I cannot feed those horses any longer. So now what do I do with those horses? Do I put those horses down? I don't want to be putting horses down and feeding them to the lion park. I love these animals. These horses have been my livelihood for my whole life. Every time I have to put a horse down, it destroys me, it shatters me. So I don't want to have to do this. And for every single horse I put down, there's a knock-on effect. The, a staff member loses his job. So now how does he support his family? It's another man that I'm having to terminate his employment. What I can definitively tell you in all my dealings with government from an export and trade perspective, we've utilised the Grant Thornton Economic Employment Impact Study. And that definitively states, and not just employed, but people who are supported by horse racing and breeding jobs is in the vicinity of 177,000 people that rely on the people who work in this industry. So that impact, that social impact is massive. There are a lot of people becoming restless and um, with restlessness comes looting. With looting comes murder. Our country is in a situation in an economic crisis at the moment. 
we were downgraded to junk status. How much more can our economy take? So we have to start thinking on a serious note. Yes, I understand that the health is in, in danger here with this virus, but our country is not that badly off and there are other countries that have opened up. We just need to take care. We have to be health conscious. I would say one has to be serious of the way one behaves. But we have to get on the road. We have to open up businesses. Businesses are going to be closing. Without business, where does the country end up? We, got to, we cannot have a, an unstable country and an, a not economically viable country. So what do we do? Do we just let the country collapse and not go on? Then where are we? Yeah, Ola, I think um, everyone got in early and, and got behind the Corona Task Force. Adrian, I think, coordinated a lot of it as well. Uh, because you know they seem to have experience with certainly with the, with the horse side of things and keeping um, training centres healthy and all that kind of thing, and they've got a quite a, a comprehensive in infrastructure and everything. So a lot was put in place very very early. Touchwood it seems to have worked, and but it's had the buy-in of everybody, the cooperation of everybody, including the grooms. Um, we, we all know what we've got to do and what's best for us. I must admit, having had the opportunity with Adrian at the beginning of the week to go into the quarters in which the grooms live with regard to the way things are laid out there. It's actually a very livable place and a hang of a lot better than some of the informal settlements that some people have to live in. It's a five-star hotel compared to the informal settlements, to be honest with you, um, Andrew, and um, uh, the guys have done a good job at keeping it clean. Um, repair, uh, extensive repair work has been done. Many millions have been spent, and I think they're very appreciative of that and will take care of it in the future. But um, racing-wise, we're doing a lot right, and you know, hopefully we'll be rewarded for that. There seems very little reason why the government would want to stop us commencing racing because it is in the welfare of the grooms, the horses, and in fact there just seems to be very little danger of anything escalating from commencing racing. Andrew, yeah, we've done a lot to keep ourselves isolated and disease-free. The same people that are going to be mixing at the track every morning are the same people that will be going racing and mixing there. But there's two things that really stick out to me, Andrew. It's firstly jobs and horse welfare. Uh, if the government based their decision on, on logic and what the fallout will be for not racing, we should race. If they don't, they've got to understand there's anything between 40 and 60,000 jobs that are in trouble. We can expect, and I know it's a very, very ugly word, but we can expect mass euthanasias. Um, we, we don't know where to give the horses away to. The second home market has virtually died. The grim reality is euthanasia. And the grim reality is mass job reductions. Can be averted if we race. That's why I think they need to think about this very carefully where they go. So even though we know that the operators are in trouble from a financial perspective, this definitely would be the final nail in the coffin. Yeah, look, I mean, how do you stay in business in, a, you know, in, a, in an environment like this? And when you are weak going into this, how do you stay alive? Um, I'd say it's nearly impossible. It's just not feasible. Yeah, we've been fortunate. Our staff have played ball. Everything's gone smoothly from that aspect. Obviously, we've had all our um, permits from the jockey club, and there has been movement allowed for for essential services. So basically, we haven't skipped a beat at the, at the training centre, and we're very fortunate. Obviously, you're in business to be in business, and racing is really what you're in business for. So I'm sure. Just like everybody else, you're hoping and praying that the government do make the right call. It would appear that the documentation that has been presented to them is based on some very sound principles. Yes, I think we, we have to commend V. Moodley on the approach that he's taken, the um, thorough way that he's gone about his business, and um, whatever has been submitted seems like you know, there, there shouldn't be too many reasons to, to knock it back, but you know, those powers are beyond us, and we've just got to hope for the best. You know, you hear people say um, that train is so lucky to have that owner and all the rest of it, but you've never made any secret of the fact that you're very privileged and very lucky to have people like Chris Finnecook and Gaynor Rupert and various other people in your yard. But there are other people that are less fortunate where the dire necessity of disposing of horses is a stark reality. Those are realities. The bottom line is we are really in a checkmate position here almost if we don't race. Even people that could well afford 10 or 12 horses all of a sudden don't have a business. So this is a reality and um, you know, the sooner we get racing, the sooner we restore a, a, a 
better perception of where the industry is going and we need to give people hope. You cited at the clubhouse in our first interview that you weren't quite sure because it was a moving target. Is that target still moving or have you got a, a bigger handle on where Team Terry and where the rest of the industry is going? Well, this is not about Team Terry, it's about the industry and the country. And, um, you know, we're in a, a, a very delicate week, should I say, that we are hoping for a, a favourable a favorable result. Um, but obviously, if it's not favourable, then the, the, the target is moving even more. So, yeah, we let's just wait for this week's decision and hope that we do get a special dispensation to race and um, keep plugging away as we go along. The NHRA and V and Susan have done a great job in making the right kind of case for, for racing. And, and for me, it doesn't matter whether it's Reikis Fontaine. I think Reikis is the proof of the case. We've done a wonderful job. Um, we've, got, we've got no positives there. We've, uh, we've done all the right things. And we've proved that we can handle racing, whether it's in a training capacity or a racing capacity. If we, if we can control Reikis Fontaine, we can control Turfontaine for a race meeting, and the same for the Vol. So I'm not sure it makes the argument one or the other. I think we've made a great argument for being able to race. It's well put together. If you want to get the economy going, and you're serious about it, racing's got to be first on the list. I don't think people out there realise how dire it is, because even if you've got affluent clients like Mary Slack and Chris Finneco can gain or Rupert, just to mention but three, they haven't got businesses that are churning out cash like they are used to. So can you imagine what it must be like for the smaller people that have got absolutely zero cash coming in and that horses get ceded to the trainer and now all of a sudden Michael Azzi might be sitting with 30 horses that he's paying for. There is going to be a terrible, terrible situation that develops. It's an interesting question. Without cash to create the stakes and get racing going to create the betting income to, you know, to support racing. Uh, you're faced with what everyone else is faced with. If you're going to look at another, um, a bunch of businesses. We were talking to lawyers this morning and they are busy with um, companies going into liquidation, business rescue, all over the place. People are losing their jobs left, right and centre. So, so if we could have supported racing through the assets that we have in advance of today, we would have done so. We are where we are because we don't have enough to, to put into the operators to actually make them flow the way to support the entire industry. And perhaps uh, um, over the years, we've supported too big an industry. We've probably produced too many horses, sold too many horses, um, not we raced enough horses. Enough. We, haven't, well, we haven't been able to export, which we've now supported with some funding to uh, the SA uh, EHP. So, yes, Adrian so Todd. Adrian Todd, yeah, he's, he's done a fantastic job. Fantastic job. And, and let's not let's not forget what he's also done. He's also created some government connections that we've been able to leverage today. Invaluable. Which have been invaluable. So we don't start completely on the back foot when yeah. we've got a government with our case for for keeping horse racing open. So yeah, um, unfortunately, I, I'd like to say that we could save every trainer. We can't. I don't think we can save every horse. Every, what we've got to do is save whatever we can.